Now I want to uh, return to this Psalm 120 and we're going to look and underline particularly verse 7 where the psalmist says, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Now, the, um, in the, uh, the channel of the, uh, the scriptures, you'll generally find it's written like this, I, I am a man of peace, but when I speak, they are for war. So we come again to a consideration of this psalm, and I want to focus on this verse 7. Now I intended to speak only on the psalmist's distress, like we did this morning. But when I started studying the psalm, I discovered so much more that I ought to say. Now I remember many years back, uh, something that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said when he was reading the scriptures studying them he says is like going into a big mansion house and you enter into the foyer of the house and you are so intrigued that you spend the next 15 years in the foyer and you have to be reminded that there are these other rooms with all their treasures that you've yet to explore. Don't you find that sometimes when you're reading the scriptures? You, you look at the scriptures and you, you find you come back to it and you learn more and more. Uh, and we seem only to be in the foyer of the building. We've got all these other treasures that we've got to look at. It's certainly true that when you get into the Bible, you find that it can never be exhausted. When you search, we find, and in the process, find a great deal more. So we come to this particular text. I am for peace, but when I, for, but, but when I speak for peace, they want war. So we see two things here. The, the Bible divides mankind into two camps. There are those who believe and those who don't. There are those who want peace and those who want war. There are the sheep and there are the goats. There are the good and there are the bad. There are those who are without Christ, without hope, without God in the world. And there are others who have been translated out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of God's dear Son. There are peacemakers who are the children of God. And there are the warmongers who make war with the saints. So you have in society, in the world today, these two camps. You have the peacemaker and you have the warmonger. Society in which we live, we live uh, in a society which has these two divisions. And of course, the object of society is to blur these divisions. We have now peddled in our country and in most of the Western world what is known as, as inclusivism. We are told that we should accept alternative lifestyles, accept all sorts of behaviour that used to be considered unacceptable. Those who are considered unwilling to do so may be required to receive sensitive training. Have you heard that? Sensitive training. If you don't, of course, uh, comply or be reprogrammed. It seems to be that the only lifestyle not acceptable is the biblical one. The watchword is tolerance. Some have almost made a god of tolerance. Yet we find these same people can be quite intolerable of any viewpoint that does not tolerate every kind of behaviour. Any deviation from the standard of tolerance is considered intolerable. You see, what they're doing is blurring the divisions that the Bible makes. The Bible makes this distinct division within society. Those who are peacemakers and those who are not. I am thinking aloud when I say that it is this inclusivism 
that has driven the rise of the European Union. I'm not being political, I'm just stating where it is within our society. It started as a free trade area and has become the only acceptable state in Europe. We have become Europeans rather than Englishmen. The leaders of the European Union clamour for their own currency, their own flag, their own army and the right to raise taxes. Those who are not Europeans on the continent of Europe are deemed as nationalists. When in reality the most intolerant of nationalists are the European Union. Now I say I'm not being political, I'm just giving you an example of where this blurring of divisions in society is taking place. But the problem is very acute in the so-called Church of Christ. In the last 30 years you have the birth of homosexual Christian groups. The reference is that you can be homosexual and a righteous person too. You can be a member of the body of Christ, says your modern church, and practice disgusting homosexual behaviour. But the Bible and the archives of Christianity teach without doubt that it is no more possible to be a homosexual Christian as it is to be a Christian bank robber or a Christian fornicator or a Christian adulterer or a Christian mugger or Christian terrorists. Whatever happened to St. Paul's directive, here it is. He's making these, these distinctives within our society. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Belial? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Oh, may God help us to keep us a unique people, a particular people, people who are identified because we are men and women of peace. We want peace, but they want war. These two camps within our society. So there are these two camps. And the, the psalmist is right to say, as the Bible is right to say, right throughout the scripture, that I am for peace, but never at the expense of truth. You see, that's one of the great problems that we're having today. Yes, peace, yes, but at the expense of truth. So I, I want to testify to the, to the fact that you can never have true peace apart from truth. We are not permitted to sacrifice truth on the altar of peace. True peace is only safeguarded by an adherence to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. There is always this danger of crying peace, peace, when there is no peace. No peace is better than a fake peace. We deplore it in our country. You will remember before war broke out in Europe, which led to World War II, and the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, uh, came back from Munich with what historians call the Munich Pact, Pact which promised peace and honour. And when, while Chamberlain stood on the balcony of Buckingham Palace, the crowds chanted, for he's a jolly good fellow. And the whole thing was a false peace, a statement of appeasement. And the Prime Minister was forced to resign. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Chamberlain was for peace, but Hitler was for war. You cannot have peace with those who have no interest in truth. But tragically, it has been the history of the church over the past hundred years. Unity has been put before truth. Core doctrines of the faith have been lost to so many because a fake peace 
has been deemed more important than God's truth. Thank God there have been those who have seen it and spoken out strongly against it. You probably realise and already understand that I'm not from these parts of the world. I, I come from Liverpool. And that's my hometown. And the uh, great uh, first uh, Anglican bishop of Liverpool was Bishop Ryle, a godly man. And this is what he says. He says, it's not atheism. I fear so much at the present time as pantheism. It is not the system which says nothing is true, so much as the system which says everything is true. It is not the system which says there is no saviour, so much as the system which says there are many saviours and many ways to peace. It is the system which is so liberal that it dares not say anything is false. It is the system which is so charitable that it will allow anything to be true. It is a system which seems ready to allow honour to others as well as our Lord Jesus Christ and to hope well of all men, however contradictory their religious opinions may be. And then he goes on, from the liberty which says everybody is right, from the charity which forbids me to say nobody is wrong, from the peace which is brought at the expense of truth, May the good Lord deliver us. May the good Lord deliver us. I am for peace. Yes, we are as Christian people, but not at the expense of truth. But I am for peace. And we can say this from the scriptures. I am for peace, but I prepare for war. I prepare for war. The nature of Christianity is that the Christian is a man of peace, but he has to prepare for war. It is not that he wants war, but he has no option. It was the mission of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. He recalled his words. So very often we, we ignore these words, but they're very important words from our Lord Jesus. He says, think not that I am come to send peace upon the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. From our Lord's words, it's impossible to believe that Christians are in for an easy ride through life. The very fact we are followers of Christ will make others declare war on us. The Christian, like the psalmist says, I am for peace but they are for war. The history of the church is one of suffering at the hands of those who are for war. So although we are for peace, we are to expect and prepare for war. Not that Christians are to take up arms. Some have done that, of course, in the past, but we must never do that, no matter how strong the temptation. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So we should never take up arms we are certainly to pray for those who are at war against us for no other reason than that we function as Christian people. Our Lord directs us to pray for such who are at war with us. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. 
that ye might be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. We can also pray for each other in this regard. How we need to pray for gospel ministers and street preachers. Whenever a man preaches Jesus Christ in our streets today, he will discover in no uncertain terms that although he is for peace, the public are for war. And so is the magistrate, unfortunately. So pray for each other. Pray that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. So I am for peace, but as a Christian I must prepare for war. But I am for peace because God is a God of peace. The Lord has given this title uh, as the God of peace in the Bible five times in the New Testament alone. Just let me read them to you. In Romans chapter 15, 33, now the God of peace be with you all. And then in Romans 16, 20, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And then in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, these things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, says the Apostle, and the Lord, the God of peace, shall be with you. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and they pray God your whole spirit and soul and body preserve blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, 20, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work. And Paul uses this title along with other appellations, the God of love, when he says, finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. The passages remind us that God has made peace and would have us know him as the God of peace. You see, sin attracts the wrath of God. But the God of love and peace has made peace between himself and those who believe the church. He has done this through his son Jesus Christ, both in his passive and active obedience. God's wrath was expressed in the death of Christ. It was fully propitiated, fully satisfied. So his wrath towards the church has been vented on his only begotten son. That is why Paul speaks of Christ being our peace. He is our peace. It was the death of Christ which secured God's peace with us. Peace could not be made without an atonement for sin. And the scripture shows that the blood of Christ shed upon the cross was necessary to make this atonement. So in the Bible, we not only have the God of peace, but also the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. He brought peace. He is our peace. God has spoken about this in the Old Testament prophets. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And then Isaiah speaks of it, doesn't he? In uh, his great chapter, in chapter 53, for he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised 
for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord have laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. When the Lord was born in Bethlehem it was a, a cause of great celebration amongst the godly. Luke records, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring thee good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. Christ saves us from the wrath of God, having fully experienced that wrath himself. Paul tells us that God spared not his own son. The full weight of the wrath of God fell upon Christ. God spared not, didn't spare the wrath, and punished our sins fully in Christ Jesus. And because God has made peace with me, made peace with you through the death of Christ, I am for peace. I am for peace. In all our relationships as Christians, we are to seek to live at peace. Because our God has made peace with us. We become peacemakers, being reconciled to God by the death of his Son. So I am for peace because God has made peace with me. But fifthly, I am for peace in the nation. I am for peace in our country. That is why Paul reminds us to pray for those in leadership in the country. He says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that in our authority. Why? Well, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour. It's so vital that we, as we see a general election looming, that we should be praying for the right leaders, men who are godly men, who are honest men. As Christians, we don't just, um, we just don't cast our vote in any old way, but we pray that honest leaders will be elected to the end that we shall live peaceable lives. Another translation has it like this. Pray for kings and others in power so that we may live quiet and peaceable lives as we worship and honour God. Let us pray for peace in our nation, says Paul, so that we can continue to worship God in peace. We should pray that we shall never witness again those barbaric scenes in Manchester when 22, 22 people lost their lives. You see, Christianity is a religion of peace. And we should pray for it in all areas of our nation's life. So I am for peace in the nation. But sixthly, I am for peace in the home. The home should be a place where we can enjoy peace. The very first family was the home of Adam and Eve, which became a broken home. There was murder in the family, a family truly broken. The home of Jacob was not much better. Very little peace there. Family members were jealous of each other to such an extent that one of them is sold into slavery. The effect of sin upon the family cannot be overstated. Even Abraham's family had its problems. One of his sons was kicked out of the family home. So the broken family has always been with us. And it would be fair to say that there is no such thing as the perfect family. There are nice families, but there's no perfect families. But we can resolve to serve the Lord in our families. 
Those who are for war are making every effort to destroy the biblical concept of the family. They redefine it. They intrude into it. They belittle it. But family is God's creation. God setteth the solitary in families. And it is down not only to the wisdom of God, but also to his kindness that he has put us into families where there is love and care and understanding. So let us fight for the family. May children, many children are being deprived of, of family. There is one parent, parent or, or neither parent. And as Christians, our families can become beacons of light to a needy society. We can demonstrate that God's design for us really works. Let us resolve with Joshua. Uh, jo um, Joshua, and he says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let us resolve to learn together, to worship together, to work together. Let us promise that we will behave ourselves wisely in a perfect way. I will walk, says the psalmist, I will walk within my house, within my family, with a perfect heart. So I am for peace in the family. And lastly, I am for peace in the church. The church is the kingdom of God, where the rule of Jesus Christ is seen to operate. Now the Bible teaches us that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of Christ is a peaceful kingdom. We are at war, but not with ourselves. So we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the peace of the church. We should endeavour to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It is significant that when the early church was at rest, at peace, it grew also. This is what we read of the apostolic church. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. When the church is at peace, the church will be multiplied. Peace is good for the church. It is what God wants from us. And we must all move heaven and earth to preserve it. That is why you get these directives for peace in the word addressed to the churches. Just let me cite a few before finishing. The importance the Bible puts on peace in the church is astounding. In Romans chapter 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after things which make for peace, and things wherein one may edify another. And in Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And then in 2 Corinthians 13, 11, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of peace and love shall be with you. And then in 1 Peter 3, 10, 11, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him enshrew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. It is plain that these verses, that the kingdom divided against itself shall not stand. And one of the problems that we've got in the churches is that we seem to be fighting each other instead of fighting the enemy. Let our churches be citadels of peace. May God grant us peace in these desperate days in which we live. Our blessed Lord has promised it to us. Let us assure ourselves with his own words, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Well, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always, by all means.
The Lord be with you all. Amen.